be alive. Good afternoon. This is yours truly, Reverend Dr. Albert Richard Sampson, pastor of Fernwood Community Outreach Church, located on the south side of Chicago, chaplain to the World Conference of Mayors under the leadership of the Honorable Mayor, former Mayor Johnny Ford, Tuskegee, Alabama, also chaplain of the George Washington Carver Alumni Association under the leadership of Brother Les Daniels. We want to also say thank you to Dr. Jacqueline and Renee King in the Black Women Empowered Network. We also want to give thank you to Brother Michael Harris and Queen Mother Harmon on, on the West Coast, a great, country, a great state of California. And to my co-pastors from Dr. King, to Queen Mother Blakely, to Reverend Dorothy Williams, as well as Dorothy Sims, and my co-pastor also, Reverend David Lowry. May we bow our heads. Good morning, God. And yes, good afternoon in some places in the world and good evening for other places in the world, but where we are here in Chicago, I want to say thank you, God, for waking us up early this morning, clothed in our rightful mind, feet to walk, hands to touch, minds to see, heart to beat. You did all of that at no charge to us. In the words of Shirley Caesar out of North Carolina, former graduate of Shell University. And I want to say to brothers and sisters all over the continent, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you. This is National Day of Prayer. I want to say that it's more like international because prayer is never isolated to a geographical location because as one of the biblical scholars for the original African Heritage Bible, we, we look at the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. We basically believe in the words of a young man who said, we are the world. I want to take you into the 11th chapter of the book of St. Luke because Luke is a physician. He was one of the doctors inside of the scripture. And since this is about prayer, it came to pass that as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. It's always good when you are talking with the power of the Spirit to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's always good to say, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. He said unto them, when you pray, say the simple words, but the most powerful words in your life will well, always be our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thou art thy will be done 
as in heaven, so in earth. Give us this day. And we would like to have our daily bread, even though we know there are thousands of people that are homeless from California to Chicago, from Atlanta to LA, to LA. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And do us a favor, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's always important for us to be told to teach us to pray. It's always important for us to want to always know how deep we need to go in order to get into the spiritual world of our Father, which are in heaven. We also want to be able to do what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught us. Forgive us for our sins. The bombing from Ukraine. All the way to the wars that's going on in many parts of the continent. Forgive us for our sins. For those that are working with Monsanto, Archer, Daniel Midland, and Cargill with the whole idea of genetically modified food and our ability to end up with more diabetes and dialysis and the weight problem of obesity. And a lot of it grows out of the fact that we are not eating what we ought to be eating because the food we eat is causing the diseases that we have. My prayer is that we understand genetically modified food on one side and black farmers and farmers who are understanding heirloom seeds on the other side. Forgive us for our sins, where what we're calling a flower is now termed hemp, and it's moving across the world. And a lot of people are dying because it gets laced so many times with, with dangerous chemicals inside of the drug industry, the cartel. Forgive us for our sins because too many people, too many people are pretending with states now participating in the drug industry. And yet, in many jails all across America and other parts of the world, young people as well as old people are confronted with what we call the nickel bag, participating behind closed doors and then ending up in jailhouse doors. And yet, we need to forgive, but don't forget the pathology of our sins on one level with the food we eat and on the other level with the liquor that we drink and on another level with the drugs we take. We challenge 
the health industry to be more healthy rather than participate in being wealthy. We thank Oprah Winfrey for her awesome documentary about the pathology that occurs and the economic suicide that occurs in the several levels of the, of the medical industry. Why is this important? Because we need a God that's going to guide us. We need people with integrity to lead us. I'm the only man that was a part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference where Martin Luther King ordained me in the ministry and his beautiful wife, Coretta Scott King, gave me a Martin Luther King watch that said, I have a dream, a deeply rooted dream. And it's very, very important that we as a people go to the story of Joseph in the Old Testament where his father ended up just simply giving him a coat of many colors. And rather than the brothers get jealous of the coat and end up putting him in a torrentious, dangerous situation, what they should have done was create a garment industry with coats asking the sisters to help. When I was in Senegal I, with the World Conference of Mayors, I was able to see cotton being grown and then being taken into the garment factory and come out with beautiful patterns as clothing to wear. Because while Somebody like the God of our ancestors was able to put dreams inside of our spirit and inside of machines that became dreams from cotton to machinery. There are some other people who are not paying folk a guaranteed wage and more stability with the good health program in the world and in our communities. There is tension that has been occurring that disturbs a lot of our people. I heard one brother say years ago, while other folk are dreaming, some other folk are in nightmares. We're in nightmares. We're in a restlessness because we have not been able to get enough people to, to answer the question, where would we be without black people? According to Martin Luther King, not based on the color of our skin, but based on the content of our character, a lot of people have assaulted us, lynched us, injured us. And we have also been in a situation where we have found ourselves in terrible circumstances that we have been able to overcome on one side and end up hurting ourselves and our people and other people on the other side. Where would we be without black people? This is a story of a little boy named Theo who woke up one morning and asked his mother, mom, what if there were no black people in the world? Well, his mother thought about that for a moment and then said, son, follow me. Come around with me all day today and let's just see 
what it would be like if there were no black people in the world. Mama said, now go get dressed and we will get started. Theo ran to his room to put on his clothes and shoes. His mother took one look at him and said, Theo, where are your shoes? And those clothes are all wrinkled, son. I got the iron in. But when she reached for the ironing board, it was no longer there. You see, Sarah Boone, a black woman, invented the ironing board, and Jan Metzliger, a black man, invented the shoe lasting machine. Oh, well, she said, please go and do something to your hair. Theo ran in his room to comb his hair, but the comb was not there. You see, Lydia O. Newman, a black female, invented the brush. Well, this was a sight. No shoes, wrinkled clothes, hair a mess, even mom's hair. Without the hair care inventions of Madam C.J. Walker and the Dudley family. Mom told Theo, let's do our chores around the house and then take a trip to the grocery store. Leo's job was to sweep the floor. He swept and swept. When he reached for the dustpan, it was not there. You see, Lloyd P. Ray, a black man, invented the dustpan. You see, he also got an opportunity to see that the mop was gone. A brother named Thomas W. Stewart, the black man, invented, invented the mop. Theo yelled to his mama, Mom, I'm not having any luck. Well, son, she said, let me finish washing these clothes. We'll prepare a list for the grocery store. When the wash was finished, she went to place the clothes in the dryer, but it was not there. You see, George Samon, a black man, invented the clothes dryer. Mom asked Theo to go get a pencil and some paper to prepare their list for the market. Theo ran for the paper and pencil, but noticed the pencil lead was broken. Well, he was out of luck because John L. Love, a black man, invented the pencil sharpener, invented the, the, the fountain pen with a brother named William Purvis, and Lee Burgess invented the typewriting machine, and W.O.A. Lovett, the advanced printing press. My point is, where would we be without black people in the, in the powerful words of the first lady of president barack obama michelle obama told us that it was our ancestors that built the white house and now we have to work on straightening out our house and the house of god and the schoolhouse. And we got to dig, figure a way to bring God into our house, which is why we have this national prayer day, so that we can be able to straighten up our house, our lives, straight, straighten up our understanding of who we are, and why God made us in his Imago Deo, in the image of God, that which God would want us to be. We got to get the house in Washington, D.C. straight. Congress, the Senate, and the House. Why? Because we got some judicial questions that are disturbing the country with this whole issue of road versus way. This whole idea that a woman should not have the right to determine what she needs to determine for her own body. Got to straighten out the house. Where there's 30 to 40 states that are hurting us on the right to vote, even after the, the country mourned for the, the loss of our beloved brother, John Lewis, 
my friend, a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a member of the congressional world, and a member who made a difference in the life of a whole lot of people that gave us the opportunity and the responsibility for straightening out the house, the political house. We have to straighten out the economic house because we met A.J. Ungersman, who met with Martin Luther King at the Penn Center in South Carolina and said, Dr. King, we need a guaranteed income and wrote a book entitled The Guaranteed Income. We have to straighten out our economy because there are too many people still in poverty. So we take our heart and hat off to the Poor People's Campaign under the leadership of my beloved brother in the ministry, Reverend John Barber, and his whole committee. We got to straighten out the economic house in America because there are too many people without homes. There are too many people who are losing their homes because of the predatory industry, because of gentrification. And this has dampened a lot of people and destroyed a lot of dreams. And that's why I'm concerned about the house. And I'm concerned about how we pray because we got to be able to say, teach us to pray. Prayer ain't a rap rap with no map map. Prayer don't mean anything if you don't put meaning inside of the prayer. I dedicate these moments to a fantastic black woman that I I saw on the news a sister who was 75 years of age, Rebecca Inge, her beloved daughter, Marissa Ratliff Duncan. Mama, when she was in the year 1965, she wanted to go to college and she went to Shaw University. But because of the world that she lived in, the culture, this United States of America that needs to be united in each one of the states and all the other Americas, what ended up happening, she ended up going into the service center. She ended up this year, praise God, at 75 years of age, she walked into the campus store and came out with a t-shirt. 65 when she went in. And she now is getting her degree. Why is that important to me? Because I'm a former Shaw University graduate. I went in 1956, president of the student body at Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. James Fox and I were the two students along with others that got arrested in the Raleigh City demonstration. I became president of the NAACP Youth and College chapters all over North Carolina. I was in the room with Roy, Roy Wilkins and Eval Blair and the others in Greensboro, where we ended up moving with the whole idea that black folk ought to have the right, the right to eat at a restaurant. I met Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson, my beloved brother, 
down in North Carolina. He's a transfer student from Champaign, Urbana to a &T. And I was at Shaw and we were student legislators for a week. And we passed the first Public Accommodations Act. That's why Reverend Jackson could, could run for president on one side and be able to articulate the issues of our people even to this day with all of our challenges and with his challenges. What's the point, Reverend? I'm trying to, to say that it's one thing to pray, but it's another thing to have faith at knowing Father always is there to help. It's one thing to have faith and another thing not to have fear, false evidence appearing to be real. And yes, we are praying. And I'm happy that we're going to continue to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven. It's very important for us to know who our Father is and who our Father will always be, our Lord and Savior. We have to see ourselves as the sons and daughters of God. We can't and shouldn't call our young people kids because kids are ghosts. Generation X's because our young people are the sons and daughters of God. And that's important to be able to know who you are and to be able to know who you are. We are a praying people. We are a praying nation. And we ought always to pray. And that's important for us as a people. William J. Gaither said it another way, from the door of an orphanage to the house of the king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags to riches, from the weak to the strong. I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God, you and you and you and you turn to somebody and tell them you belong to the family of God. And so you have to always know that today is the day of national day of prayer. But you ought to be able tomorrow to get with some people and say to them, let's continue to pray. Because we have a whole week, listen to the word, we have a whole week, W-E-E-K. But some people who might feel weak, W-E-A-K, we want you to say, I'm weak and I need some prayer and you ought to be able to to say to some people not based on the color of their skin but based on the content of their character you, you, you want to be able to say to folks that tomorrow is friday i, I want to pray you might want to call some people and say why don't we just pray this morning because god woke us up and you're my best friend You've been my friend down through the years, and why don't you just call them? Dial up a prayer. You've got somebody in jail. You've got somebody in the hospital. Why don't you call their relatives who, who probably ain't in the hospital, not in the jail? Why don't you pray for them and with them and just say, look, look, there was a preacher, the only man that was ordained by Martin Luther King a member of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, where we had a we had a symbol, a flag. Our flag was to redeem the soul of America. Why can't we just make every day a prayer day? And 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 everyone that we know 
why don't we make them a part of our prayer team? There's a lot of folk in our culture, and I make the assumption in other cultures, that have prayer warriors in their churches. But let's have it in the block talk. Let's 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 have prayer warriors. Just some people who why don't you just be a telephone warrior rather than a telephone warrior? Why don't you be a warrior and be able to say, I love you, I appreciate you, and I'm just calling to let you know you're not by yourself, that you can reach out anytime and give the people your phone and give the person your phone number. Why don't you say to a young person on their way to school, and they're playing on their way to school. Why don't you go to start praying for them on their way to school? And why don't you say, you know, I'm proud of you. I see you got a book bag. And I want you to be able to let me know how your grades are. And if you get good grades, I'm gonna give you $5. If you get good grades, I'm gonna give you $10. If you, if you get good grades, I want to give you a gift like Dick Gregory used to do for all of us. He would pass out $2 bills and, and, and write, write on the side of the bill about a black man named John Hanson who was sitting down while everybody else was standing up. But the point that, Jeff, that Dick Gregory was trying to let us know that it's okay to love people. It's okay on one side to make them happy and not hurtful. It's okay on the other side to be able to show them that you're proud that they're on the way to school and they're not trying to be a fool. They're on the way to a position of responsibility. I just want to close out with, with, with these great people. I just want you to see them. These great people, I want you to see them because these people realized that they had to pray and not P-R-E-Y where people were prayed on. They were praying, P-R-A-Y-I-N-G. Listen to these words as I close. If these great people could speak today, what would they say? What would they tell us? Mary Bethune, Mary Claude Bethune, who started the college, would tell that first comes a first for knowledge. W.C. Handy would have you see that music in every heart should be. Art does more than nature can to reveal man and more man's self to where they can. George Washington Carver would have you find in the earth the wonders that therein lie. Paul Lawrence Dunbar would ask you to dream no matter how sad your life sometimes seems. Du Bois would ask you <laughs> to stand up proud and proclaim your freedom clear and loud the souls of black folk and matthew henson would send you at length to far out lands with courage and strength harriet tubman would say right on with the underground railroad of the brotherhood and sister of man and woman had fully dawned. Martin Luther King Jr., who spoke his mind, would call for thinkers. God never let a fool take care of his kingdom. Martin Luther King, who spoke his mind, would call for thinkers. 
of the fearless kind. Is this what they would tell us? Is this what they would say? If these great people could speak today, and since you're great, and you're a part of the family of our God, and the family not only of your neighborhood, but the family of your school, your city, your church, and your God that we're praying about in National Prayer Day. Don't be silent. Be confident that you can be important to our people and to everybody's people. We will never forget a particular lady that ended up coming out of Detroit because Martin Luther King ended up calling for the nation to come. We'll never forget two boys who came from the Jewish culture to the black boy who came from the our culture. And only thing I'm trying to point out, when this national prayer day, everybody's sacred. And everybody can be somebody because God made them. God took his time. And you ought to be able to say to yourself, no trespass. I'm the private property of God. I'm not Richard Rice, the outside. I'm not Ralph Ellison, the invisible man. I'm not James Baldwin. Nobody knows my name. I am the son and the daughter of God. I'm a phenomenal woman because of the sister that wrote the poem. May the Lord bless you and may the devil forget to take you. In the name of the God of our ancestors, we pray.